Hi, I'm Steve Murray, the Mime Guy, and I'm excited to be part of Ignite through this video link. I was asked to speak to you about God's love, and instantly the thing that came to mind is the story of the parable of the lost son. It's got to be one of the most powerful ways to express how much God loves us. So I'm going to read it to you first, but then afterwards I want to share with you as best I can some more in-depth parts of the story, things that are so easily overlooked and missed. So a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Give me a portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. That means wasteful. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into a field to feed the swine. And he would have gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hands and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things mean. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed a fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. So who is Jesus talking to? Well, if you read earlier on in the chapter, he was addressing sinners and tax collectors and the Pharisees. The tax collectors were the most despised Jews in the land because they worked for the Romans. The Romans were being the occupying force. He didn't work for them. Not only did they work for the Romans, but they paid for the privilege to work for the Romans. And then to earn their own money, they would take more than what was necessary from the Jews. Actually, many, many, many times more than what was necessary. You know the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, where he took four times more, kept most of it, but gave the Romans what they needed. It was thieving. So that's why they were hated. These guys didn't actually do the tax collecting themselves. They employed thugs, the sort of really down and outs. And that's, what, that's the group of people that that Jesus was talking to. And on the other side, you had the Pharisees. They were the righteous people of the day. They were like the top priests. They walked around and they sort of stuck their head up high and proclaimed to be so good. 
but actually their heart was in a very different place. That's why Jesus was so against the Pharisees, because they set laws and rules and regulations that were impossible to keep. And they walked around proclaiming that they did so, but actually they didn't. They were hardened to God's love. They were just trying to get attention and, and acceptance by work rather than love. So the story begins with this young man and he goes to the father and says, can I have my inheritance? Now, even in today's standard, that would be really shocking. But back then, it was all about honour. In the Middle East, it still is today, so much about honour, family honour. So can you imagine you going to your father and saying, I wish you were dead because I could really do with my inheritance. I kind of thought you might have popped off by now, but oh, come on, hurry up. Yeah, can you think of that? That's so shocking, isn't it? It was even more shocking then. To ask your father for your inheritance was saying, I want you dead. That was punishable. What would have happened is the father would take that boy into the marketplace, into a public arena, and with a piece of wood, a plank or a, or a stick, beat that boy publicly and say, this is my son. He's dishonoured my name. It was a shocking thing to do. But what was even more shocking, especially to the audience listening to Jesus' story, was that the father agreed. That was outrageous. This father would agree to such a thing? It didn't make sense. The audience would be scratching their head thinking, where's this story going? Because it's so not realistic. So the boy takes his money after the father has divided the, the property. He would have given two thirds to the eldest son and one third to the youngest son. He would have had to have sold the land because he didn't have cash lying around. All their money was tied up in property and in livestock. So that part of his would be sold and then he went into a distant land. Here's the next issue, so often overlooked. Jews didn't like to live in other areas at that time. They kind of stuck to themselves. They believed that other lands were sinful people lived and they worshipped false gods. They sacrificed their children. They just did bad things in the eyes of the Jews. They were called Gentiles and they didn't like to go there. They kept themselves in their own land. So for this boy to go and live in another land was again another problem. A problem for the audience to understand and then of course he spent his money on prostitutes which we don't need to go any further into but then came a famine after he'd wasted all of his money a famine came you know we never know what's around the corner who would have thought that 2020 would have been a year of such famine around the world but back in those days everybody had to look after themselves it was Everyone for themselves, if there was a famine, you didn't give money to anybody else. You kept very much looking after your own interests. So this man was broke, he was starving, and he had to go to a foreign citizen, fall on, the, on his knees and beg for some kind of charity. That was so dishonourable. We find that the man was sent to feed the pigs. Oh boy, it just gets worse and worse. At this point, I'm surprised Jesus even had an audience because Jews didn't mix with pigs. Jews, Jews thought that pigs were unclean animals. They were like the lowest of low animals. They couldn't eat or even spend time near pigs, let alone live amongst them. He would have been covered with the smell of pig, the poo of pig. It was just not a nice image if he was a Jew to get your head around. Finally, the son comes to his senses. Have you ever got to that point where you're like, what have I done? This is the point that the son got to. What have I done? He remembered his father, how generous he was, that he had servants that had more than enough. So he decides to go back. In reality, he would have had to have gone back to a beating 
to several meetings with probably his eldest brother to talk about how to get back into the house again, how to get back into the family, uh, how to pay back the debt, long, long before he could finally meet the father. But also the big issue to overcome was that in his father's eyes, this boy was dead. He was buried. This is serious stuff to go back to. And all the way he would have been thinking and planning his words. What am I going to say? What do I do? You can imagine it, can't you? But before he got back to the village, his father saw him. His father was looking out for him. His father was waiting. You see, God is waiting. God is looking out for us. The father had compassion. He ran he ran to his son. Now this is again something they just didn't do. Men had honour. They also wear gowns. He would have had to have whipped up his gown and he would have had to have run exposing his skinny white legs with mud and dust flying everywhere. It was just undignified. But that's how much God loves you. He would run from a distance if you would come back to him. And then he fell on his knees and he hugged his son and then he embraced him and he would have kissed his neck as it said in the scripture. But don't forget, he would be covered in pig poo. He would have stunk of pig. He would be dirty and stinky, but yet he still embraced his son and kissed him. This is a picture of our God. Do you recognise this God? This is such grace. The Pharisees wouldn't have understood this grace. But the father wipes the slate clean. The boy was restored and given back his full sonship, restored because the son returned with a repentant heart. Bring out the best clothes, the father said. Put a robe over his back to give him back his honour, covering his smell and his dirt. He put a ring on his finger and the ring spoke of authority. He put sandals on his feet. Now in the household, Servants were not allowed sandals, they had to have bare feet. So to put a shoe on your foot is basically saying you're back in my family, you're back in my household. The fattened calf would be reserved for the, for the firstborn's wedding. You wouldn't kill a calf just for a couple of servants and a brother and a son. You'd, you would invite the entire village round for this party. This is an exciting story that says God celebrates when we come back to him. He is an incredible, joyful God. He wants to give you life to the full. He's not a distant God. He's not a boring God, but he is a happy God. He wants you to be joyful. He wants a party with you. And then we get to the eldest son. Where was the eldest son and who was the eldest son? Well, in this story, Jesus was was addressing the tax collectors as the prodigal son and then was addressing the Pharisees as the eldest brother. Let's see what the eldest brother did. Well, first off, he was in the field. He was working. He had no relationship with the father. I think I would have known if my brother had come home. I would have known that there was a party going on. But now I'm off in the field trying to earn God's love, trying to work to get approval. That's a shame because he was missing out on God's presence by trying to work for acceptance rather than just be accepted. So then... He asks the, the slaves, the servants, what's going on, and they explain to him, and uh, he's not happy about it. And then with a very disrespectful manner, he says, no. It's like, what? Whatever. It's a shame that the eldest son had completely missed the point. He was jealous, angry. And this is exactly how the Pharisees would have behaved. But the story doesn't end there. It does in the sense that Jesus finished the story. But the story doesn't have a conclusion because Jesus knew how the story would really end. 
Remember that this parable is just a story, but it has a true ending. So what does the eldest son do? Does he go into the, into the house and hug his brother, welcome him back? Does he stand before the father and say, I understand? Come on, let's go and enjoy ourselves. The story ends with the brother taking a piece of wood and beating his father to death. That is the true ending of this story. Jesus was beaten to death by a piece of wood, now to the cross. The story was shared to the lowest of society. The lost son, such a shocking character that no one in the audience could say, I am worse than this character. The story was also shared to the righteous people who thought they had everything but missed everything. But where does it affect us? How do we fit into this story? Do you find yourself sometimes a little religious, trying to earn God's love by works? Or maybe you find yourself more of a prodigal son that keeps messing up and keeps doing things wrong. There's a bit of a orphan spirit to their heart, a bit of a loner, go out, do everything on your own, party. Probably you find yourself doing a bit of both. Sometimes we think we don't deserve God's love. Well, we don't really. But God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Sometimes we think we can do something to earn God's love. This is called religion. Nothing you can do can make God love you more than he already does. That's the good news of the gospel. God loves you so much. Why? Because Jesus died. Jesus took upon himself all of your punishment, all of your shame, everything you have ever done that you would consider bad in God's eyes has been taken care of by the cross. That's why God can run to you and throw his arms around you, because Jesus has taken the punishment. You see, the work of the cross was a finished work, not a, well, it's almost done or not, well, it's finished until something better comes along. When Jesus hung up on the cross, he said, it is finished. So if you find yourself like the prodigal son, if you find yourself living in a pigsty, I don't know what that would represent in your life. Maybe drugs, maybe sex, maybe alcohol, maybe rejection, maybe fear. Whatever it is in your life, whatever it is that identifies you in such a negative way, Jesus has paid the price for it. He's died for it. Come back to the Father today. He'll run and meet you. He'll pick up his gown and run through all the dirt and dust to give you a hug. That's how much the Father loves you. If you say yes today, you become a child of God. That becomes your identity. You know, you don't need an identity in media and magazines and commercials and image. Your identity is in God, not in what you do, but who you are. You are amazing because you are a child of God. So I shall sign off. Steve Murray, not the mime man, but a child of God. I do the mime out of the overflow of my love for God, not for who I am. I don't get approval for what I do. I get approval because God loves me and he loves you. God bless you.